Does this help us understand what norms are? No, nobody's wrong. Nobody's right. Everybody's a bit right and a bit wrong. Except when everybody agrees. When everybody agrees and you don't, you're probably either a revolutionary, you're going to make a lot of money, or you're going to lose all your clients very quickly. Norms, okay? Norms are not discussed as such in your normal classes. Norms are not discussed when the teacher comes in and says, translate this text, and you don't ask how, for whom, why. Uh, there's not going to be much discussion of norms, and yet they exist for that kind of problem. I want to move on to expectation norms. This is not done, not studied by looking at what people actually do. It's at what people are expected to do, and what others want them to do. Okay? And I'm looking here at a set of surveys. Actually, there's a missing one by Bühler from 1984. 94. Anyway, uh, I've just got three surveys of interpreters. So, interpreters, this one is for you. It's a questionnaire survey, and you ask conference interpreters what is the most important part of quality in a rendition? What's most important? Okay, and they're given these options. I simplify the different research projects, okay? So, for example, 2004, Chiaro and Nocella, uh, 286 interpreters were surveyed, and they replied that the most important thing was consistency with the original, then completeness, logical cohesion, fluency, correct grammar, and you could read the rest. Nobody's right, nobody's wrong. I mean, in an ideal world, all these things are absolutely important at, at 100%. But in reality, we will feel better if some things are achieved, and we will tolerate imperfection in other respects. For example, having a native accent is not always important for interpreters. For obvious reasons. They're interpreting a foreigner. If they have a slightly foreign accent, well, who should, who should care? Okay. Um, note that Chiaro and Marcella, uh, number eight, was having a pleasant voice. Okay. Now, those were from interpreters all over the world. And, and you can't talk about norms there, you can just see here some data on preferences. This was repeated in 2010 with 704 subjects by uh, Zischenberger and Perkhacker. And the results are here. And you can see that. Consistency with the original, which would be a sort of equivalence idea. Very good, number one. And the others, more or less followed. Logical cohesion, three into two. Fluency, uh, these are all okay. And there's only one problem here with completeness of information. And I can't explain why it moves from number two to six. Do you understand what I'm doing? I'm just giving the rank in which it was considered important. But in general, these two surveys would give us a fair idea of what interpreters consider uh, their norms. The norms of, of quality, what's, what's important to quality for. And, and I, would, I would go back to the question about completeness and see what people understood by completeness of information. I suspect there might be some misunderstanding, or the question may have been phrased in a different way. I don't know what we're talking about. What bothers me this week, and this is this, this week because I got, I have a student in Brazil who's using the same survey on people in Brazil. And she's just got eight of her friends to do it and to see what happens. And look what happens. Fluency of delivery, that is not pausing. Fluency of delivery is number three and number four for some surveys, and is number one in Brazil.
Consistency, which was number one in the other surveys, that is an equivalence type relationship, is down to number four. Not that important. And pleasant voice, which was actually translated in the questionnaire as lively intonation. Okay. This means, you know some interpreters, not those ones, some interpreters are going, and he said that it was a, a lively voice, not a pleasant intonation. And that, you get that when people are interpreting? Um, uh, was rendered as lively intonation. Okay, that's that you. And he said that people have lively intonation. Is that important? Not for the other surveys, but in Brazil, we suspect it might be a bit more important. And that goes hand in hand with native accent, which in Brazil is up to number six. Okay, now we've just done that, and we're saying, wow, this is strange. Okay, it's only eight people. We don't know where this is going to go. What are you going to do? Get more people. But we have to sort of figure out what we're looking for. Okay? Now, it could be that people in Brazil are wrong. These eight people are wrong. Just outliers, just wrong with them. And that it could be that there is one universal norm for the interpreting profession, which is the way professional organizations like the AIC would like to present it. Interpreting is one thing all over the world. But it could be that in Brazil, people like lively voices. And people like, what was number one? Fluency. You know, just make me feel good. Give me a good voice to listen to. I don't care if, if stuff's missing. I don't care if it's in, what was in the source text. Just keep the samba coming. <laughs> I, I hesitate to characterize all Brazilian interpreters in those terms. But it could be the case. Okay. It may be that we are getting indications here of different norms operative in different countries. And it's not an illusion, I think, because going into it and, 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 and uh, looking at who these people are and how they work in Brazil, we're aware that there are many different kinds of interpreting <coughs> events. Whereas the whole AIC members here are talking about a big congress with many different speakers on technical topics, a lot of the people in Brazil are working with smaller groups, more interactive groups, where social cohesion is more important. That is, we're aware that uh, there are many different kinds of interpreting events and there may be different norms for different kinds of events. So before we say, this research with eight subjects is too small to say anything, we could say this could be indicating the need for a more subtle analysis of actual kinds of events, kinds of purposes, if you like, and the norms that go on within them. Corpora, very easily, very quickly. Hmm. Get a whole lot of source text, throw them in here. Get a whole lot of translations, throw them in here. And then compare the two linguistically. And you find differences. Okay? Here's one difference. In the Spanish source text, there were that many distinct words, and that many running words. You know, you know the difference? Mm. Um, uh, the woman saw the dog. The woman saw the dog. Five running words, okay? But there are only four different words because the has been repeated. Got it? So there are four types, but five tokens. You can measure that very quickly on a whole lot of texts, and you get a number, type token ratio, which tells you the degree of linguistic variation in the text. And you find consistently that translations have a lower ratio. Translations have less variation than the source text. Okay? And it's not a law, it doesn't have to be true for all texts. It's just something we find in many, many different genres and many, many different acts of translations. 
that translators use fewer different words. A norm? You don't really know. Some propose it's more than a norm. I'll come to that in a minute. It's been proposed that there are some features that are perhaps universals of translation. Things that happen in language simply because we are translating. And we're not aware of them. If you like, there are norms, but we're not penalized for them because we're not particularly aware of them. And they tell us something about the psychology of translators. These universals were formulated by the Tel Aviv School in the late 1980s. They have been studied in other terms and by other people <coughs> since then. One is the one we've just seen, lexical simplification. Translators tend to simplify language, use fewer different terms. At the same time, uh, translation, translators tend to explicate. Explicate doesn't mean explain. Explicate means you become more redundant. Consider this. In English I can say, the woman that I saw. I try to be non-sexist. The woman who I saw, the man of the can't be not sexist. The dog that I saw, okay? I can say that, right? Uh, or I can say the dog I saw. The connector, that, is optional. It can be in or out. Translators tend to put it in. They tend to put it in. I don't know about interpreters. I would like to study that for interpreters. It hasn't been studied. But translators tend to produce texts that are more explicit. If the source text doesn't have the connector, the target text probably will. If the source text doesn't tell us anything about Eton, the target text probably does. People want to make implicit information explicit to help the reader. More of more interest perhaps is this one, unique items hypothesis. All languages have words or structures that are peculiar to those languages. Okay? Or at least are found only in that language and not in the source language. All right. uh, some examples. One that I love. If you don't speak Catalan, please learn it. It's a really great language. Do you know why? It has, you know, all Romance languages at least have problems with the past tense. You don't know if it's a distance past, if they're perfect, imperfect, etc. Catalan, no problem. You use the auxiliary to go with the infinitive, and that covers the whole past, any kind of past. Bachana, I went, or I have gone, or I've been, doesn't matter. Bachana. Right? Beautiful, beautiful structure. Doesn't appear in any other language that I know of. It's a unique item. All right? Other ones. In English, we have this peculiar verb tense, to be past participle. They are to be married. You are to be here on time. That's a sort of imperative, but they are to be married. <coughs> Means it's very hard. What does it mean? They're going to be married at some time in the future, but it's already settled now, and nothing can change it. All right? Uh, in your languages, I don't know, does anybody have a language that translates that kind of tense? Something is to be done, past participle. I don't know of any other. Okay. Anyway, the, the research is actually done here on Scandinavian languages. German has these wonderful participles, doch, noch, that, that don't really show, which don't really do anything. They just add sort of weight and values, but the other languages don't. Anyway, the idea is this. <coughs> when translators translate into a language, they don't use those terms. So, for Catalan, I get a whole lot of translations in Catalan, a whole lot of Catalan texts that are not translations, and I look for that verb tense, and I find, and I do find, that it's in the original text and not in the translation. And you can do the same for the other things I, I, I mentioned. That unique items 
items in the target language uh, that are unique or in that language but not in the source tend not to be used by translators. Why? Because they're following the source. That's the simple way. And I'll mention a last one here because it is germane to the, the topic that most interests me. Uh, formulated by Miriam Schlesinger in the late 1980s, in her master's thesis, actually, uh, The Equalizing Universal. Uh, Miriam Schlesinger <coughs> looked at interpreters working in a whole range of different situations, and she noticed that there are signs of all these other universals happening, or tendencies happening, but the, the one that predominated was this. When the incoming speech was very written, a judge reading out a sentence, the interpreter made it more spoken, gave oral features, well, because they were talking. Okay? And at the same time, when the incoming language was very spoken, when the speaker comes up and says, uh, hmm, well, it's good to see you today. Um, I really don't have much to say, but um, uh, you're bright, yeah. Microphone's not working. All the things in spoken language that are hesitations, repetitions, redundancy, things you say to keep people awake on a Friday afternoon at almost five o'clock. <laughs> uh, all those that, that oral culture, the interpreters leave them out. And it's true, interpreters leave out all the redundancies, hesitations, repetitions. And you don't even talk about it, it's just a norm, people do it. Uh, she said, well, the idea is this, when you're translating or interpreting, you leave off the extremes. You leave off the extremes of, of orality and writtenness, and you head towards the safe middle path. Not too written, not too formal, not too spoken, not too raggedy around the edges. I like that. I like that idea. It seems to, to work for interpreting and for translation. It also has to do with the explicitation. Because remember the example I gave you of, what was that, the dog I was saying? The dog that I saw and the dog I saw well, it turns out that if you get a corpus of spoken English and you compare it with a corpus of written English, the elimination of that is a spoken phenomenon. It, it, it indicates morality. And that if translators don't follow it, they are in fact opting for a more written solution, moving towards what could be the middle ground. So that equalizing hypothesis might, just might, uh, be able to channel the categories of orality and readiness back onto the other features. The lesson for us is that descriptive translation studies, this kind of research, could be of interest, I hope, to practitioners. To this, in the sense it holds up a little mirror and saying, look at what we've seen you do. Did you know you were doing these things? Have you ever thought about why you're doing these things? Would you like to change what you're doing? Okay. It could be of use in your training, I hope. Some of my translations went into the corpus at Manchester, at the uh, University of Manchester. They have a translated English corpus. They have translations in English and non-translations. And they compare the two and, and test these kinds of universals. And as soon as I saw the um, Explicitation Universal, the one about that, as soon as I saw it published, since that day, I have never put in connected that in any of my translations. I've used the research to make my translations more oral and contradict the proposed Universal, showing it's not Universal. No, it shows that there are norms there, and it's useful, I think, you know, to show people what happens. These, these, these are norms, they're not rules, they're not laws. You can break them if you want to, and you want to do something else with your translations or with your renditions.